So I was so pleased to be asked to come for a whole afternoon. I get a whole afternoon with you and I get to, and I've even got a little more time, which is very nice. I can slow my voice down. Those of you that don't know me, I'm Dorothy Armstrong, as she said, and I'm an OT working in Salbridge. I also do a bit of lecturing in NUI Galway. I'm also a mother of two boys with dyspraxia, and the little lad has a few other additional bits, <laughs> as I'm sure many of your children have. So I come with, I suppose, a couple of different hats, actually four or five, oh, loads of different hats. <laughs> so hopefully I'll be helpful to you today. And our first talk will be about helping your child manage their behaviour. And then the second one is also really important. And most parents think, ah, it's about self-care for me, I leave. Don't. <laughs> Stay for that. Prioritise yourself, because that's really important. You need to mind yourself. Every time I give that talk, actually, I go home and I think, oh, I'm doing that now, I'm going to be better in minding myself. But let's start with thinking about our children and how to manage their behaviour. And you'll know that the slides are available to you. Once you fill out your evaluation form, um, NPC will send you a copy of the slides. So you don't need to even be writing down everything. You can just sit, relax and drink it in. <laughs> The first point I suppose I want to make is that, kudos to these kids, um, when we talk about their behaviour, we have to remember that it's harder for some of these children to manage their behaviour. And don't we wish everyone else knew that as well? <laughs> that would be really nice if you were not getting comments in the supermarket, you weren't getting people telling you to keep your child quiet, because they've no idea what it is to walk in your shoes, or what it is to like for this little child in their little body with whatever they have. Some kids have problems with emotional regulation. They go from 0 to 5 very quickly. It's really hard for them to steady themselves. So that's going to make it hard for them to manage their behaviours. Some kids have great difficulty processing sensory information. They're constantly being bombarded with sound and touch and, say, and um, tastes. And it's really tough for them to manage behaviour. Be like us trying to manage the behaviour when we're in a busy airport and everyone is shouting at us and hitting off us and it's all very stressful. Uh, sometimes some of these children can't really get another person's perspective, don't really understand why you're asking me to do this or why would I need to do that. Like I know my, my youngest lad, we talk a lot about social rules and Tom would say, social rules are blackmail, mom. <laughs> That's just a form of blackmail. And he's probably right. But there's a thing about it, it can be very hard to understand somebody's point of view. And some of these kids find it really hard to be flexible. So they have something in their head and then you're asking them to change it and it's not easy for them or you've got your big plans. I remember like you'd be saying, we'll go off and buy shoes today, and my young lad would say, well, you didn't give me warning. I can't go and buy shoes today. <laughs> it's not on the agenda. And I'm oh, yeah, yeah. So problems being flexible, and some kids really are very impulsive, aren't they? And that's tough for them, and that is so tough. And I've worked with teenagers like that who just... They do it and they think, oh no, what did I just do? Why did I do that for? So that impulsivity. So we begin with great respect for these kids. We're going to talk about how they manage their behaviour with the absolute respect that it is not easy for them. And we're keeping all this in, ha in hand. So there are the ABCs. You've probably heard of your ABCs. So when we're thinking of behaviour, we need to think what came before the behaviour what is the behaviour and what was the consequence to that behaviour? We tend to only repeat things that work for us at some level. We're getting something out of it, even if it's a very negative something. So it's uh, the antecedent to the behaviour and the consequence, and we're going to work through each. So if we think about antecedents, the first thing we want to think about, especially for these kids who we know have difficulties with a range of things, can we actually make it easy for them? <laughs> can we change the environment for them so that they're not triggered? What can we do to make life nicer and easier? I put that safe space there. And it's for you in your house even having a safe space somewhere for your child. And some of the kids I work with, that's under the stairs, like Harry Potter. <laughs> they've got their little snug under the stairs and they've their bean bags. For some kids, it's a tent they bought in Smith's, a cheap tent with a few cushions in it. For some of them, it's their room, but they need a little space that's a safe space for them to go to and that's attractive. That's not a timeout space. That's a happy kind of safe space for them. 
So we want to think about when you kind of have your child in your head and think, okay, what triggers it? Could it be sensory? Now, the thing with children, particularly kids on the spectrum, sometimes they've been at school all day, they come home and they're very upset and we're like, and in school they'd say, oh, nothing happened in, in the last hour or the last two hours. Some kids take a long time to process stuff. So it could be five hours later and they don't really, their bodies are processing the feeling that happened during the day and they're not able to tell you that. But there's probably something that happened before that behaviour and it might not have happened immediately. So it's serious detective work for you. Was it a sensory issue? Does it always happen at the same time of the day? Does it always happen when they're with such and such? <laughs> that little lad or that little girl that just gets them very hyper. Is it always that context? Or is it the type of task, something they really find hard to do? So the first thing you're trying to do is try to think what triggers the behaviour. And always we think of our supersonic senses. So I would say to the kids, you've got supersonic senses, the kids that I work with. Not, I wouldn't normally tell them sensory processing disorder. I'd say your senses are supersonic. You're amazing. You hear more than I do. You see more detail than I see. You feel things more than I do. You're incredible. But that means you need to mind yourself well. So that's the first thing we do with our kids is we think what's in our house to mine their little sensory systems. And it could be an old mattress. Don't throw out your mattresses. <laughs> Keep an old mattress. Put a cover on it or the dust will be all over the place. And maybe they just need to... Tom had one of those. He called it Matty when he was a little boy and he used to bounce on that and that might be their safe space or their way to get... Because um, sometimes the reason behaviour isn't great can be they're feeling very angry or they're feeling very frustrated. That's an energy they need to get out. So maybe when they come home from school they need to go bouncing on the mattress, they need to be going over onto their peanut rolls, onto their hands, getting all that lovely input up, sitting on their bean bags, sitting on their little wobbly cushion, um, bouncing on their space hopper. Sometimes behaviours you see during homework are caused by sensory issues. So certainly, and I could talk about clients, but I won't. I talk about my own kids. Um, I know with Tom, the retro space hopper, he still uses that for homework. He'd still get on that and kind of, okay, that helps him think. So sometimes when we tell a child to sit down and do their homework, that's a, not a great plan. They can't. So getting them and allowing the movement is good. And fidgets and blue tack or anything they need. And in your own heads, you're probably now thinking, yeah, yeah, we could do this, this and this. Get them an outlet. Mind their we'll do questions after if that's okay. Great stuff. Great. <laughs> Everyone loves it. <laughs> okay, so the other piece we want to think about as well as your sensory, minding their little senses. And did I have the... I had the headphones there. They're important as well, the earphones. Sometimes a behaviour is caused by another child crying and your child hits out because they can't stand the noise. And sometimes just having those ear defenders in place... Often kids, if you give them to them first, they don't like them. But just leave them around the house and gradually they'll pick them up and try them on themselves. If you have a child in the spectrum, it's because it's new. Anything new is you're suspicious about. So just leave it around. Same with any of these things. Little tactile boxes, the ear defenders, the mattress. Just leave things around. That little chewy tube, that's to be put on the end of a pencil for chewing, for kids that are chewing everything, called a chewies get it from thinking toys as far as I know thinking toys it's the only place I can find those and you can put them in a bit of hot water and it'll it'll spread and then it'll go on the end of a pencil if it doesn't fit on your pencil so think about their sensory needs and again we're just going to touch on stuff today the other thing that's really important with a lot of children is knowing what's next so another way to manage behavior before it happens is to give them a schedule. For some kids it's a full schedule and for other kids it's just first and then. We're doing this first and then we'll do that and some kids that's enough. But if they don't know what's going to happen they can get stressed and that can cause behaviour that's not working for them. The other piece down there is a timer and it's got a big red disc on it and as the time goes that red disc closes off and they can see how long they're... So you might say, you're going to do your homework for 15 minutes, and then you're going to have a break. And then, I'm saying this because a lot of behaviours are around homework. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 15 minutes, 
on the clock, a little bounce break on, on Matty, the mattress, or whatever it is, and then another 15 minutes. And if they can see it, it helps. So you're remembering that first slide and all they're bringing to the table that might be difficult for them. So you try that. Because sometimes they've those in school, but then over the summer holidays, you're not, we don't use them, and the kid's getting really upset, and you're wondering, what's going on here? But they're used to having a schedule and knowing what's next, and it's really nice to have it like that. The other thing we need to think of before behaviour is we need, they need to know what's expected. Sometimes that's a problem for kids who find it tough to understand social rules. They don't actually know what's expected of them in this situation and that's tough for them. So for a verbal child, you might put those angry rules up on your... You'll get those on Google Images, those very ones, the angry rules. Um, most of my clients probably have them stuck on their fridge. Uh, the angry rules are that it's okay to be angry, and with some kids you have to nearly help them understand what anger is, but you don't hurt others, you don't hurt yourself, you don't hurt property, and you do talk about how you feel, or you do jump on a mattress, or you do run around the garden, <laughs> whatever it might be. But they need to know what's expected of them. For helping them to manage their behaviour for a more verbal child, you can. this is a lovely little strategy where maybe you're coming up to an event where you know it's going to be hard for them to behave in the socially appropriate way. So a good example of that might be you're going to a wedding, okay? You've been invited to a wedding and you have to go, and your kid has to go, and they're not happy. <laughs> so instead of just trudging off to the wedding and you could have your visual schedule, why not make a plan beforehand? So the first thing is, it's KITE actually, it's an acronym, KITE. The first thing is knowing the situation. So the, helping the child know you're going to be going to a wedding, you're going to be expected not to speak in the church, you're going to be expected to whatever your expectations are. Um, so knowing what they're supposed to do, and then let them try and come up with a plan. So actually, I worked with a little kid recently who found going to the doctors, the poor pet had to go to the doctors a lot, found this really hard, and uh, he was doing behaviours that weren't working for him in the doctor's surgery and getting into trouble. So we did this with him, knowing what he needed to do in the doctor's surgery and making a plan. He made this gorgeous plan. He was going to bring his therapy. He brought a picnic with him. And he had what he was going to have in the picnic. And he brought a couple of little action figures. And he had them all in a bag. And that's it. He tried the plan. And when we came back, we evaluated the plan, and it worked. He managed to manage his own self in that time because we were empowering him. And a lot of behavioural management is really about trying to eventually pass the reins to the child. It's not about us trying to control a child. It's trying to teach them self-control over time, isn't it? So this is a lovely little way to do that where you can make a plan and get the child making the plan if they're able. Your next piece then is the behaviour itself. So you've thought about what's going to go before the, what comes before the behaviour that's a problem for that child. And as far as you can, you're managing the triggers and you're not putting your child in a situation they can't cope with. But still the behaviour might be there and then you need to think about, okay, how will we manage this behaviour? And it's really all about, is that behaviour working for your child? Is that going to work for them going forward? Is that going to be something that's going to be helpful for your child? So when you're talking about changing behaviours, you need to be really specific about the behaviour you're wanting your child to work on. So if you have a verbal child, you'll tell them, don't say, I want you to be good. What? <laughs> what does that mean, I want you to be good? They need to know, what exactly does that entail? Does that mean um, that I'm... What, you know, be very specific to your child about exactly what you're looking for and consider how many behaviours you might work on with your child. Re for some children, you work on one at a time and it's plenty. I would never work on more than five. It's too much. You know, if you keep going, your child is going to feel like... They're not getting a break. They're, you're their therapist constantly, and you're their parent. You're not, you don't want to be getting down that road. So consider how many you're going to target, and then allow your child a chance to shine while you're doing this. It's like you write them a little program, but your main thing is you want your child to feel really good about themselves. 
particularly if you have kids. I don't know if any of you have children with ADHD and things like that, because those kids have real difficulties experiencing praise. They find it really hard. They did this kind of reward deficiency thing going on, so they need loads of praise. And lots of our kids need loads of praise, so it's important to get a chance to shine. And when you're thinking of the consequence to the behavior, you want to see what's meaningful for them, uh, what might work for them. Um, and you want to go with positive reinforcements as much as possible, certainly in the beginning. And then you involve your child in choosing target areas and choosing what they might work on first, if that's possible for your child. Involve them as much as possible because it's about self-management over time. And you might need, if you have a big behaviour, you might need to break it down into a little smaller thing to work on first. So be specific and be consistent. Consistent is the hardest bit because <laughs> you kind of think, oh, I'm tired today, I can't be bothered getting the reward chart out, looking for the stickies. But if you let it go once, you're, you're scuffered. You have to be very consistent. You have to keep going. So your... Um, what you want to do when you're setting a goal for your child is you target what they are to do rather than what they're not to do. So a good goal wouldn't be don't hit your brother because that's what you don't do. And if you're trying to reward a behavior, how are you going to reward that? Don't hit your child. When do I reward that all day long when you don't hit your, you know? Um, so better to say when you're playing with your brother, uh, keep the ang I will keep the angry rules or something like that or I will have kind hands and explain what kind hands are and then they can get a sticker if they've achieved that that's better so here are some good goals I will keep the angry rules this week I will stop playing on my iPad when my mum or dad tells me to and they give me a five minute warning <laughs> that was one when a little kid I worked with recently came up with I loved this how specific it was. <laughs> Although I have to have a five minute warning. I will do my homework after I watch, <laughs> name short favourite programme, and have a snack. <laughs> but you can see the child is getting to negotiate in there because we're not going to come up with that. The child is thinking, yeah, I will, but I want this first. And then they're getting empowered. When I feel angry, I will go to my room and jump on my trampet. And that might be a behaviour we're looking for. So when we're setting our goals, as far as we can, we want them to be specific for that child. So be a good boy or girl means nothing to them. So you're breaking it down into something more exactly what you're looking for. What they will do rather than they won't do. You have to be able to measure it. That just means you have to know when they've achieved it. <laughs> so you have to be able to see it. It has to be something they can do. Don't ever set your child up to fail. You wouldn't do that anyway. Something that they're able for at this time. The big thing you want might be down the road. Where are you going to start now? It needs to be relevant for your child, so that means they're involved and it makes sense to them. And in the end, it's about what works for them. And you can, time bound is important as well. That might mean you'll have achieved this goal by a certain amount of time, or it could mean when you play with your brother for 20 minutes, you will have kind hands. It could be something like that. Does that make sense? So, some children work really well with a contract, love it, especially when we say this is a legal contract, it's going to be so exciting and we're going to sign it and, we're, and I'm going to sign it too because we're all part of this and you could, I, if you have a laptop, type it because it's so impressive and have a little logo maybe on the top, make it very serious. So your child has come up with the goal. So my goal is, the consequence to achieving my goal will be, and it could be praise, and I'll talk about consequences in a minute, you might want to have a consequence for not achieving the goal, but I wouldn't go down that road unless you have to, and then signed by, and you all sign it, but the child signs it first, even in an X, and it's all very child-led, and the child is on for this, so the child is really agreeing with and feeling empowered, and actually that con that contract works. Um, that seems to be a very powerful tool. So, we've talked about what goes before a behaviour, we've talked about the behaviour itself, and now we're going to talk about consequences. So, as far as possible, we want to do positive reinforcement. So, you're thinking about what might positively work for your child. I talk about re response cost as well, and I talk about self-management. But let's have a little think. Reinforcement is what happens directly after a behaviour. So say if a child is in school and they, um, 
it, this happens a lot with poor kids with ADHD will often do something and the rest of the kids think this is really funny and they get a great laugh and that behaviour is then reinforced. That's then, oh, that, that's a great thing to do. I'll be the clown. And then a lot of our work is you do not want to be the clown in the ring. You do not want to put yourself in that position. But their behaviour is being reinforced, isn't it? So we're thinking, what can we do to reinforce this behaviour happening? Now, the first thing you want to try is just plain praise, because that's the best, isn't it? If you don't have to be going buying prizes, <laughs> going off buying little magazines, great. But to be honest with you, it's better. The, the less is more. So if you can get by with praise, don't be putting the big guns in place. Go with the, ease, the, the least kind of reinforcer you can, and then it's easier to fade or take the reinforcer away once the behavior is learned. One thing you need to be really mindful of is that inconsistent reinforcement. Do you know those uh, one-armed bandits, the, slot machi the gambling machines? They're really powerful, um, the most powerful thing. They're very addictive because it's intermittent reinforcement. Sometimes you win and sometimes you don't, so you could end up there all day. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever played those. <laughs> But they're very addictive because of that. And that's the same for our kids. If we're not consistently reinforcing them in the way we want to be re reinforcing them, they might be getting odd, like from classmates, reinforcement intermittently, and, and their behavior might be strengthening. So whatever you decide to do, stick with it. That's really important. Stick with it. So consequence. We're thinking, what can we positively do? Because our goals are always written in the positive, what they will do. So we might provide, um, in the beginning, reinforce as often as possible. So every time we see them do that, say, oh, you're brilliant, that's great. And you know with your kids you can't plum off them, so you can't. It has to be real. So it's like, yeah, you did that particular thing really well. That's the best praise you can get when it's specific praise to something. Individualize the reward. That means what does your kid love? So what might they like? So for some kids, they just love sticking stars on a chart and there doesn't even have to be a prize for the amount of stars in the chart the stars or the little stickers are enough for some kids or for some kids they're mad into those um, Pokemon cards or the oh you know those Yu-Gi-Oh cards Pokemon cards and they might do their goal in order to win that prize but the prize is agreed on in the beginning and you can vary the reward you know in schools they do this now they have the little bag and there's little rubbers in it and <laughs> pencils in it and things token economy works very well token economy means that every time they do well they get a star and then if they get a certain amount of stars then they get the prize rather than a prize all the time and then you can um, Shaping means that if that behavior is looking too hard for them, pull it back. So it could be that maybe they can't manage 15 minutes keeping the angry rules, so you break it back to five. You've got to find, you've, they've got to have a win. So there's no point setting up a program if they're not getting a win. Start them on what they can win on and then move it on. And then involve the child as much as possible in evaluation because you want to move them into self-management. Do you think you should get that star? What do you think? Because that's really where we're looking for, self-monitoring. Response cost, so positive reinforcement. So you're all thinking what you might use for your positive reinforcement. Response cost is invaluable as well. And again, I remember using this with Tom. When he was a little boy, the scariest thing ever, we'd be out in town going off, doing like a, the, the big lad had music lessons in town. We'd be there every Saturday. It was a nightmare every Saturday because Tom would shoot off. Sick with worry. It's very, do your kids do that? so scary and the only thing that worked was response cost so what happens here is we gave Tom three discs in his pocket and every time he ran off we took a disc away <laughs> I know but when he went up but we had to because it was not safe for him to run away and when he went home whatever discs he had left in his pocket turned into stars and went in his chart and then he got a prize with the chart so we were kind of mixing a little bit of positive and a little bit of taking something away if you ever do that you must never ever ever take away a star that's on a chart you can't do that because that is so unfair and a lot of these kids are very into what's fair and what's just and they will not thank you that
that'll be the end of that. Never take anything off a chart. But instead, try the little discs or the little stars, and that works really, really well for those very scary, dre desperate times. But ideally, kind of make that, if well, Tom was too little at the time to have made that anything to do with his choice. But if you can make it their choice, that's great. I love this. This is about um, enabling your child to see how did their response work for them. I would use this all the time with the more verbal child. If you take nothing else, take this. <laughs> what this is about is we sit down. Now, you have to sit down with your child in an absolutely non-judgmental, scientific manner. You're two scientists and you're just thinking about the behaviour. And you would say to your child, you're not in any trouble. We're just going to try and figure this out. So what you do is the first column is what I did when I was angry or what behaviour I did. or It doesn't have to be when I was angry, just what I did. I don't know why I put the angry there. What I did. And it could be when I was in school, I picked up my teacher's phone and I played a game on it. It could be something as simple like that. Or it could be when I was out playing with my friend, I, um, they didn't let me be in goals, so I... I punched somebody, you know, and you're trying to keep calm <laughs> and be non-judgmental and you're scientists, you're oh. um, but it'll only work if you can come at it from a calm space and you put that down in the column and then what you do in the next column, now that doesn't mean they, they haven't had a, like you might have had a consequence for that, but you're also sitting down later, later and thinking of it. What happened to me as a result of picking up the teacher's phone? Teacher was really angry about that. I have no idea why, but teacher got very angry because I picked up her phone. Because we talked about not getting someone else's perspective. Maybe they saw the phone, they thought this would be great fun. They haven't added the piece of, mm -mm, you're not really allowed to do this. So the consequence for me was that I got in trouble. Imagine that. <laughs> I got in trouble for picking up that phone. Or when I was playing with those boys and I punched them, those boys didn't want to play with me again. And um, that boy's mum came out and gave out to me, and that was a consequence. So really work, walk, walking them through it. And it's what happened to you, which is the main thing, to be honest. And the next column there is what happened to others. Often that's not quite as interesting, but it's a very good learning thing. It's a very good learning piece. So for the teacher with this particular child, it was like, okay, if I... I like my iPad and I don't like it when anyone takes my iPad. So if someone took my iPad, I would feel like this. So teacher must have felt like that too. So sometimes there's a lot of dialogue and problem solving there. Or the child might get it straight away. Like, but sometimes that's why you're very non-judgmental and scientific in it. Because you, you want to know, where is this child with this? Do they even know that's not a great thing for them to be doing? Um, so for the child that was punched, how do you think they might have felt? Hmm. Well, if I was punched, that would hurt me. Now, you have some kids, of course, with those um, tactile systems, they don't feel input much at all. So it's hard for them to understand that that hurts someone else. It doesn't hurt them. I don't know if any of you have kids like that. That makes it more tricky. But you can explain what were they doing. They, they cried. So what does crying mean? What does that mean? Do you think they were upset or were they happy? You can throw kind of clangers out like that till they know what the consequence to others were. And then at the end of it, you ask them, OK, we've looked at this very logically. How did that, it's a real Dr. Phil moment, <laughs> how did that work for you? <laughs> because at, for most kids, Typical kids as well as children who are differently abled, it is all about what works for them. <laughs> That's what's really important. What? How did that work for me? And you circle your, um, your coloured little faces. A smiley face would mean, do you know what? That worked really well. I think that's a great thing to do and I'm going to do it again. It was great. Great idea to take teacher's phone. The little face with the line means it was okay. It, it was an okay thing. It worked kind of okay. And the frowny face is, that really didn't work for me because I got in trouble. And that was a really bad thing. And I didn't get out to play as a result. So circling is good. And I've never worked with a child who gets that wrong, who circles the smiley face when they've done something like punch or take a phone. It's interesting. But if I ask them straight away, do you think that was a good thing to do? They'd, a lot of the kids I work with would look genuinely puzzled. 
I'm not sure why my teacher was cross by that. But breaking it down is about self-management and empowering them and giving it, them a chance. What I do then, after they've thought about what they did, I ask them, what could you have done differently? Because that's important, isn't it? Because some kids don't actually know what they could do differently. And that's the problem. They've no idea. I'm not to do this. But if I don't do this, what do I do? I don't really know. So giving them the chance, and don't give them the answer. Give them the chance to think, what could you have done differently? So with the phone, it might have been simple. I, I, I'm not going to pick it up. <laughs> but maybe in the, in the example I gave you where the child hits the other child, it could be, I'm cross. So what I need to do is get on my bike and do a lap on the bike. Because when I'm angry, I know I might punch somebody. So I need to do something about the anger. Or I need to um, take a breath. Or I need to squeeze my hand. Sometimes it's a practical thing the child needs to do. Because we know some kids can't regulate their feelings very well. And I get the kid maybe to come up with three or four ideas of what they could do. And then I ask them to circle which one they think might work best. And then the next time it happens, they try that out. And we come back and we talk about it. Isn't that lovely? If you've a verbal child, that would work very well for them. Um, this has been nice because I've had more time than I should have. Let's not forget the really important thing for these children are, A, that they're loved no matter what they do. So we love them forever. So your behavior might be dreadful, but that's your behavior. That's not who you are. So we're really careful with our language. So we never say, you are bold. So we wouldn't. You are so naughty you are so we never say that because they are not their behavior is sometimes <laughs> but they are not and we love them forever so they know that and, and also when you're working with them even saying to them or as, work, when, as their parents when you're um, helping them with their behavior you kind of say do you think that I'm trying to help you change this behavior because I, I'm just kind of trying to annoy you. And the child would probably say yes in the beginning. And it's given them the chance to say, oh, no, it's not like that at all, um, John or Jack or Jane. I really love you, and I really want what's best for you, and I really want you to be able to shine, because I know you're the best kid ever, and I want everyone else to see that too. And they're not going to see that unless you learn these social <laughs> rules or whatever the rules are. That's really important, that love you forever. And the other thing that's really important is the sign of great parenting is not the child's behavior. Now, the reason I say that is probably every one of us in the room have been out and been given out to because our child was doing whatever in the shops and um, being noisy or whatever. And we take that on board and then we get anxious and we try to make our children behave so that we don't look bad. Now, and that's natural. But as far as you possibly can, wear that on a card and take it out. The sign of a great parent is not my child's behavior. The sign of a great parent is my behavior. The fact that I don't actually sock the person <laughs> in the shop who's just told me to do that, I'm doing really well. <laughs> but that's very important, isn't it? So that, that, that you, you, um, you don't judge yourself on your child's behavior. And you do, and that's why you need to come to the next talk, because you do need to think about self-minding. Even though it's 25 past, I have used up my time, because uh, I'd planned it for 30 minutes. So if we're going to have a question time, I think there's a box with questions, isn't there?